Thank you, Lashan. That's one of my favorite songs. And you did it so well. And thank you so much, Doc, for inviting me. And it's good to be out on a Friday evening with family and friends. We, most of us know each other, Steve. We go, we go way, way back, don't we? <laughs> Too far back to say. Well, <laughs> dream on. <laughs> dream on. <clears throat> As some of you may know, I pastored in Boston, Massachusetts for several years, eight years as a matter of fact, and I had the privilege of baptizing many, many people. And, but the most memorable one was a Portuguese lady and her husband. She was the cook for Archbishop Bernard Law. And he gave permission, he gave her permission to be baptized as a Seventh-day Adventist because he didn't want to lose her. She was such a good cook. <laughs> and um, on the day of her baptism, no one told me that she was afraid of water being on her face. And so I decided to have her husband in the pool with me. And on that occasion, because her husband was in the baptistry with me, I didn't have a deacon or a deaconess in the bapt baptistry with me. I was by myself with husband and wife. And the time came when I did all the things, you know, put my hand up over her head, all of those that we do when we baptize. And then I took her to put her under the water. And suddenly, as the water touched her face, she began to flutter and move around and everything. And she grabbed at air at air, and then she grabbed at my hair. Well, what she didn't know was that I was wearing a wig. And that morning, I had failed to pin it down because, you know, you pin it down with pins and things and things. And so, and so I want you to imagine this sight, that I have her, and I'm like this, and she's grabbed, and everywhere she moved, I'm moving my head with her to prevent the disaster that would happen that day. Well, praise God, the hair didn't come off. <laughs> and she was baptized and then her husband after. And unfortunately, both of them have passed away just last year. They both passed away one after the other. It's, it was a humorous event. It was a humorous occurrence happening in a sacred act. And I know I did my best to not make it any more humorous than it could be. But afterwards, when I got in the car, I just broke down and laughed my heart out. Not because of what happened, but because of what could have happened, but didn't. This, it's very important that we remember that baptism is a sacred act that has been distorted by some churches where sprinkling is sub substituted for immersion. And I don't know if you know, know how this came about that they started sprinkling, but originally all, all baptisms were done in a river. The Jews did baptism in a river and when the Christians took over they followed suit. And the person who, the, the officiant stood on the bank while the person who was being baptized went down into the water and immersed themselves. John the Baptist did not go in the water with Jesus because they believed that the water washed away whatever pollutant, sin, it symbolized the washing away of sin, and they wouldn't be in the water where the washing away would touch them. So John stood on the bank, and there are um, pictures, not, you know, there's a word for those pictures where they draw showing 
the, the baptizers on the bank and the people going into the water. What happened after when the Roman Catholic Church took over, they, they, they found in, in the church of the Sophia Hagia, the, the, when they took, they found a mosaic and they, when they took down this mosaic, behind it was, was the watermark where the historians believe that that was where baptism in the form that we do it started. And historians suggest that they, they started that because the priests had so many vestments and so many things that they did not want to go into the water anymore. So they came up with this idea of putting what some people call a, a huge bathtub inside the church to, to have people baptized. And, and we've inherited that and we've carried it. There's nothing wrong with that, but I'm just sharing with you the, the transition of baptism. So some people still baptize in, in the rivers and, and we, can, we do both. I've baptized many people in the rivers and have had some very humorous experience, too many to tell tonight. Others, others baptize babies and, and you know they sprinkle a little water on and I, I think that's another distortion of this sacred act. So what does the Bible say? What exactly does the Bible say about baptism? Tonight, by examining several scriptures, we will discover various types and biblical reasons for baptisms. And the first, one, the first thing that I'd like to share with you is a, a working definition so that we are all on the same page. When I say baptism, we are, are all speaking of the same thing. And so let's start with a working definition of baptism. As you know, as I've said, it is a sacred act a sacred ritual of the Christian church to publicly demonstrate that a person has accepted Jesus Christ as their personal savior. However, although in the original language the word baptism means to immerse or submerge, it was originally used to describe the process of dipping vegetables into vinegar to pickle them. The word baptizo comes from originally used to describe the dipping and leaving of, pickle, of vegetables in vinegar to pickle them. And then it was later used by merchants who dyed cloth. So a broader meaning would be to immerse something like pickling something to change its quality, or by put, putting cloth, taking cloth of one color and immersing it in another color so that it would change the color. The Bible speaks of three kinds of baptisms, and I, I'll talk about all three. The first one, by water. And if you will open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 3, we look at verses 13 through 17. <clears throat> in fact, <clears throat> we could begin at verse 11 because it contains part of what I want to share with you. Matthew chapter 3, beginning at verse 11. So Johnny is speaking, and I'm jumping in the middle of this narrative. And John is speaking, and he said, As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So those are the other two kinds of baptism. There's baptism by water, baptism by the Holy Spirit, and baptism by fire. And now verse 13. Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? 
But Jesus answering said to him, permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he permitted him, and after being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God ascending on a, as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved son, my Jedidiah, in whom I am well pleased. I want you to note that Jesus himself was baptized and immersed in, in water. And the interesting thing is that we, we continue to, to symbolize the dove coming down on the head of Jesus. Did you know that when we Adventists hold our hands over a, bap a candidate that we're baptizing, it's not because we don't have a place to put our hands, it's not because the robes don't have pockets, it's because our hand represents a symbol of the dove that came down upon the head of Jesus. To, so, so we're saying to the person, not only are you publicly immersed in water, but we're also um, publicly stating that you're anointed by the Holy Spirit to be a, an ambassador of Christ, to summarize. So, so, so there, there was baptism by water where the person was immersed in the water. But Matthew also said that there's baptism by fire. And if you will notice, Jesus was not baptized by the baptism of fire. Jesus, all other people, the disciples and us, were baptized by fire by water and by fire. And the reason is in the meaning of the word for fire. It's, the word for fire is pure or pur, and it is the, the word from which we get purity. And Jesus didn't need to be purified because he experienced all that we experience, but we, he did not sin. So there was no need for him to be baptized by fire. But all sinners thereafter need to be baptized by fire, and not necessarily um, natural fire, but the fires of tribulation or trials, which we all experience when we begin to shed the skin of the old life and to take on the, the, life, the new life. The, the disciples were baptized by this fire represented by the Holy Spirit, and we look at that when we look at Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. But the important thing is that the, the, the baptism by fire is still used as a colloquium today. When, when we want to say that somebody went through a terrific time, what do we say? They were baptized in the fire, right? Or they were baptized by fire. So the, the idea of this baptism by fire is to purify, it's, it's the act of purification, the spiritual purification that should take place in the life of a person. Although baptism will not save or cannot save a person, and because only Jesus saves, as much as possible, every person who accepts Jesus Christ as their personal savior should be baptized. And when a person is baptized, there may be no harps or angels singing or the sound of music, but life after must show the sanctifying work of Jesus. And this brings to mind the passage in Isaiah 1, verse 18. And you note know that I'm doing more teaching than preaching tonight. And I hope you don't mind. But I have lots of Bible texts and I prefer to use that mode of delivery of the message that God gave me. So Isaiah chapter, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, where 
the prophet wrote this, Come now, and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. Well, the important thing to know is that Jews believed that, and it's written in some of their extra-biblical writings, Jews believed that you could change the color of anything except scarlet or crimson, red. And here's what the prophet Isaiah is suggesting, and I'm probably reading into it or, or extrapolating meaning from it, but this is what I gather from what the prophet is saying. Though your sins be as red as scarlet, and though they be like crimson, and there's nothing that you can do to change that color. When we are baptized in the blood of Jesus Christ, it transforms us like the dyeing of cloth. We go in one shade and we come out another. And, and I love that verse as a result of, of this concept. So here's, here's what Paul said about baptism, if you go with me to Romans chapter 6 verses, and we look at verses 3 through 11. Romans chapter 6 verses 3 through 11. And we are still now, we are still talking about baptism by water and fire. And you remember what they are? Baptism by water represents the going under the water to come out and live in such a way that others who knew you will be able to see the gradual transformation as you grow, as we grow in Jesus Christ. And the fire, the baptism by fire, is a more personal experience where we go through trials and tribulations because we've now taken unto ourselves the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are now, we've gotten rid of the filthy rags of sin by the blood of Jesus, and we are now living a life in Jesus Christ. There's, so, so here's what the Apostle Paul says that that life should look like. And I'm skipping verses one and two in the interest of time because I have several texts, and want you to go with me to verse three, Romans chapter six, verse three. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized or immersed like the cloth or the pickle and came up out of, went down one way and came up the other way, who have, those who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that Christ, as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of God the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. In order to really understand this, or in order for me to really illustrate this, we have to understand the biblical doctrine of the state of the dead. I know that we normally use the state of the dead to demonstrate that when people die, they don't go directly to heaven, and that is true. But I don't believe that's the intent of the biblical doctrine of the state of the dead. Because just as Jesus uses the birth of a child to indicate the new life, I believe that the death of a person should indicate something in the present life. So, for example, if, you, if we have been baptized into his death, we go under into his death before we come up out of the other side alive. This, this death, in this death, we should forget everything that we knew before we became Christians. And remember, please understand that I'm talking about sanctification as if it happens at one time. It doesn't. But the process begins so, so that if someone who was filled with anger is baptized into the death of Christ, when they come up out of the other side, 
there will be Holy Spirit reminders that you're in your new life, you can't be angry like you used to be because the dead know nothing. You got it? The, 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 the dead people, they don't love, they don't hate, they can't even worship God. So, so if, if we have been baptized into the death of Jesus Christ, remember, we've gone under, we not, haven't come up yet. Because, and, and the reason why it's important that we come up is because we're dead. And we're going to experience what Jesus calls the second resurrection. In John chapter 5, Jesus talks about two resurrections. And... And one of them has to happen in, when we are alive. This resurrection has to happen because after we've died, there's no chance, there's no anything. But anyway, that's another story. I could get off track very quickly. So, so here, here's the thing. Those who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death. And when Jesus died, he knew nothing. During that period that he was in the tomb, he absolutely knew nothing. He felt nothing, he saw nothing, he heard nothing, because when you're dead, you're dead. So this is the idea that the, Paul, I believe, is, is communicating. He says, therefore, we who have been buried with him into his death through baptism, so that as Christ, just as Christ was raised from the dead, so now we have the resurrection, through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk, and you know, in, in, in the Hebrew language, sometimes the word for walk is the same word for faith. Halakha is the same word for faith. So it's not just walk, it's walking by faith, Abraham believed God, Halakha, or sometimes it's translated, Abraham walked with God. And so, and so this walk is more than just walking to church, or you, you understand, most of you are in seminary, you've heard this before. So, so we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. We were buried into death. We come up into new life. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin because sin died in us. But here's the problem, that extra-biblical stories helps us <clears throat> to understand. In the time of the Apostle Paul, when the Romans crucified people, sometimes they would crucify hundreds of people, and they would go around breaking their legs so that they wouldn't be able to breathe and they would die. But sometimes they, would, they, they, they had so many and they would have to rush off to another place to do, to take care of other criminals, that they would not be as careful about breaking the legs of the people. And relatives, I read one story where relatives of some of the crucified people would go around and find their relative, and if they're still alive, they would take them down from the cross and take them home and re revive them and resuscitate them, and they would be alive again. But here's the problem. Everyone who was crucified, there was a death certificate for them. It may not have been nailed over the cross like Jesus, but the Roman government, who was very meticulous about keeping records, would have a death certificate that John Doe was crucified on, October, on November 3rd, whatever date it was. And that person who was crucified, but is now alive and doing well, 
if they had children, their children could not take their name because they're dead, according to the Roman government. They couldn't buy property. They couldn't own anything because they were dead, according to the Roman government, even though they were alive and well. And here's what the Apostle Paul is conveying. Subtly, it's implied that when we are baptized into Christ, death, the old self is dead. But the problem is sometimes we don't wait for the old self to be really dead. We take the old self down out of the grave and then the old self comes into church and becomes divisive, fighting, wanting to have place. And here's what the Bible says. The prayer of that person is an abomination to the Lord. Why? Because the Lord does not speak to the dead. They will have to repent and surrender themselves to the death in the death of Christ. This is powerful. I love this Romans 6 passage because it's, its meaning is so far beyond just reading the words here. So, if a person is really dead, did not take themselves down or have relatives take them down from this death or out from this death, here's what Paul says. Verse 7, those who have, have died in, is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, and here's the key, even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin. You didn't take yourself out of the grave. But alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin rule or reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness for God. For sin shall not, cannot, will not rule over you anymore. You may sin because it's in our DNA, but you repent and you we have an advocate who is Jesus Christ, and we continue to grow. And, and, and every fall is like a, a, a step in the ladder upward toward sanctification, in the process of sanctification. This passage has had tremendous impact on my own life. You know, I was an atheist, and I lived the secular life I did everything that my heart desired and pleased me. And if you've gotten to know me, you know that as a member of the body of Christ, I'm still like that, only it, I'm ruled by Jesus. Yeah, I, I, still do, I still do what I desire as long as Jesus approves of it. If humans don't approve, it's okay. But as long as I get his approval, and I'm in constant conversation with him. And, 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 the, and the great thing about this relationship is that he leads me toward a place where I have come to the understanding that I am radically loved by Jesus Christ, even when I fail. And here's the other thing that shocked me. Jesus likes me. You know, 
Anybody can love you, but do they like you? Jesus loves you, and he also likes you. And, 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 and our baptism should demonstrate this relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. So, so let's look at let's look at another verse. The the which describe to to describe the third baptism. We how how much time do I have left? About five minutes. I'm going to do this very quickly. Then, the, the remember baptism by water, baptism by fire. Jesus was baptized by water and the Holy Spirit. We are baptized by water, fire, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And so, so the third baptism that's mentioned in the Bible is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we find that in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. You know that story very well, but I want to show you a few interesting things that keep me awake at nights as I consider this great gift of salvation that we receive in Jesus Christ. So turn to Acts chapter 2, and let me just show you a few things. So in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, verses 1 through 5, the, you know this is the day of Pentecost. This is 50 days after the crucifixion of Jesus. We, we are told that when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And it's not just that they were physically in the building, but they were together in spirit, in, in prayer, in, in all these different ways. They, they had resolved their differences, and there was a lot of differences between them. You remember how some of them said to Jesus, I want you to appoint me to be the head hunter. You know, it's not like they just were, you know, all ice cream and cake kind of... They, they, they were messed up men and women. And remember, there were women, 120 of them, and they were messed up men and women. But they were able to resolve their differences, to confess to one another. And that's a shortcoming in the Seventh-day Adventist church by people who were baptized. We will not resolve our differences. We'd rather move away and start a church than resolve our differences. And, and, and th this shows me, I could be reading it wrong, but it shows me that somebody, when they were immersed in the death of Jesus, decided that they stayed too long, they didn't want to stay long enough under the water to die, so they jumped out of the pool. <laughs> that, that, that's my, you know, I, I didn't get that from God. I'm like the apostle. I didn't get that from God. I came up with it in my own head. So, Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit was giving them utterance. And now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men and women, and the text continues. Here, here's the thing that I want to point out to you. Jesus told them to wait there, and they would receive the Holy Spirit. Chapter, Acts chapter 1, it's very clear. Jesus told them to wait there. So they knew that the Holy Spirit was going to come. But when it came, it was suddenly. And we have some experiences like that. You know, when you love someone and, and we, we know that they're in the last days of their lives, when that last breath goes, it's like suddenly, isn't it? We knew it. We believed it. But when it comes, it's shocking. It's surprising. 
because it's different, it's new. We've never had any experience like that before. And suddenly, and this, this, this noise came down from heaven. And notice that it didn't come up from the earth, it came down from heaven, and it was echoing the sound like a mighty wind. If you've ever been in a hurricane or a tornado, or there's the sound of a mighty wind that puts chills in your bones. It's, it's an eerie sound that, that this was like. And, and, and Luke, who heard the story from Peter and other disciples, tried to communicate what they told him they heard using words, metaphors, similes, so that we could understand that it was like a tornado blowing violently. And it filled the house. I want you to underline that word because it appears a couple of times in this passage. And the first time it appears where it says, it came from heaven and filled the whole house. And notice not just part of the house, but the entire house. The rooms where no one was were also filled. It's not just the room where they were, which tells us that no church can contain the Holy Spirit in a sanctuary. He's going to fill beyond in the restrooms, in the passageways, in the hallways. And that's how we know that we don't have the Holy Spirit. Because some of what goes on when we come through the doors of the church reminds us that the Spirit ain't there yet. Some of the conversations that we have in the restrooms tells us that the Spirit ain't there yet. And the Spirit filled. The, the word that's used there is, is not like rain. It didn't fill it like rain coming down. You know, when rain comes down, it comes down and then fills. This word that's used here describes the process of a bathtub being filled. You know, when you turn on the water, the bathtub fills from the bottom up. And so the, the house was filled from the bottom up until it covered them over the heads and filled the rafters and filled every nook and cranny in, in the place. And, and, and so they became immersed you see, here, here's the reason I believe why this was filled up like this. When we baptize someone by immersion, most of the times we miss part of their head. You ever notice that? We, we very seldom really put people under. We do a quick thing and bring them up. But this way makes sure that everyone gets fully immersed, that the immersion was above their heads up into the ceiling as they were baptized. The tongues like fire, again this word pure, pur, from which comes purity, purifying, is present, presented in one single tongue. This is the idea that Luke says. This one huge flame of fire came into the room and filled, look, listen to, to the next word, filled, verse 4, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. This is a different word. And this word comes from how a butcher chops meat. Yeah. So here, this huge thing that looked like a tongue of fire, you know, like a flame of fire, came in. And as when it came in, and I have to put this here, when it came into the room, the, you could literally hear the sound of it splitting, being chopped, chop, whoosh, chop, whoosh, chop, whoosh, chop, whoosh. And, and so not everyone got it the same time. You get the idea? So when we're praying for the Holy Spirit, we all, according to the level of our relationship and the growth that we're experiencing, will have a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. But the idea of this word is on that day as they sat there at their different positions, 
this huge flame that came in began to split itself like a, you can hear when, when a butcher, you're all vegetarian so you don't know, how, but you know, I came from a meat-eating family and we used to kill, kill the goat and chop, you know, chop it up and as kids I could hear the sound of that chopper thing going through, through the meat and the wood and then it went on their heads. Isn't that awesome? So that none, none of them could say we're all, we all got it the same way, the same time, the same. They, they all had an individual filling, personal filling of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to wrap up here. So, so here's, here's this. The, the important thing that this passage tells us is that when the Holy Spirit fills a person, he never does it in private. He never does it when you're alone in your closet. He does it in community. When we are all gathered together in one place. And I think that's perhaps one of the reasons why we're not experiencing the presence of the Holy Spirit because we are very diligent one by one praying out there for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And he's waiting for us to come together as a church and say we're not leaving this room till you manifest yourself in each one of us. I, I believe just like everyone receives a measure of faith, when we begin the journey with Jesus Christ, everyone receives a measure of the Holy Spirit. But we're talking about the baptism and the immersion in the Holy Spirit is never done when people are alone. Even when the Apostle Paul anointed some disciples that did not know of the baptism of Jesus, it was in community. Baptism? Immersion in the Holy Spirit happens in community. And I think one of the tasks of this revival of hope is, is for this church to gather together and pray and seek the Lord and say to him, we will not leave this room. No class is going to make me leave this room. No dinner is going to make me leave this room. And if you have children, make arrangements with someone because we have to take care of the children. Make arrangements with someone and, and lock that door and say to God, we're not going to leave this place. And when you're doing it, I, I, I don't want to be passed by by Jesus. I, I would like to be part of that scenario, to, to, to be present when in community we become immersed, baptized, by and in the Holy Spirit. And may God bless you as you seek and find him. You know, many years ago, I was, um, I was in Toronto, and uh, I was doing something called porting. Yeah. And I was invited by a small Sunday church you know, in a storefront to... Um, to sell some books. When I got there, they had some issues at the church. And all I heard was a pastor saying, um, nobody's going to leave here today. We're going to lock the door, and we're going to pray until the Holy Spirit comes. You know, I was more about selling books, so I made my way through the door and escaped. But um, <laughs> as, as you reflected on that, I'm also reminded of um, Jacob, who hung on to, yes. to, to, the, to the angel yes. and said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. That's right. You know, so uh, it, it, that spoke volumes to me, and I think that, that's a very good way to end. I'm sure there are some reflections, some questions, something that you'd like to clear. Uh, make them short so we can take a few as much as possible. So, Steve, I'm going to hold the mic, and you're going to speak. I thank you so much. This is, again, a breakthrough lecture, sermon, evening from my lifelong Adventism. For you to say that the word baptism comes from vinegar and vegetables and preserving them 
my Germanic pickle festival heritage from, from here in Berrien Springs. I thank you so much. And that is what that water or whatever it is, Jesus says, Jesus the Christ of Nazareth in heaven is going to preserve you for eternity. And you've chosen that. And thank you. And then fire is purity. So this is what we're doing. We're trying to get our lives and, and as pure and, and what to do. So when I was asking folks around here, I was saying, this will change your life. Amen. And, and I, so it's some more for folks. I mean, this is history, art. This is God's word clearly spoken. And, and yet it's for preservation and purity that we have the privilege of sharing God's love as much as we can. How can we do that better tonight, tomorrow, the next day? Amen. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, if you've never eaten ice cream and you try to describe to someone how tasty ice cream is, you're not going to be able to really touch the deep parts of their nerves. And I think before we go out and start telling people about how good Christ is, and how good our church is and all of these things, we should ourselves be, be the ones who have tasted and seen how good it is. And so when you tell somebody that it's good, you know, you, you, you can tell someone, this is good, but when it's really good because you've tasted it, your eyes and your tongue, you know, you kind of lick your lips and tell, that, that conveys a personal investment in this yes all right well there's a yes. another question here yes steve thank you all right thank steve you. here's another question thank you very much for this presentation uh, my question is um does that mean i could be a stumbling block to my brothers and sisters receiving the holy spirit by not coming together in united prayer and um, does that mean no matter how fervent I could pray on my own, I have to be in united prayer before I could receive the Holy Spirit? Then my second question is, in the Bible we have signs that came after receiving the Holy Spirit. Do we still have those signs today? And what are those signs? What are the evidence that we can see and say, this is actually after the Holy Spirit has come down upon us. Yes. All right. Y yes, the, the, the Bible clearly states that immersion or baptism in the Ho Holy Spirit takes place in community when there are groups of people together. Every instance in the New Testament that I can recall where the people were baptized by the Holy Spirit, there were a group. There was a group. And <clears throat> Jesus deliberately told them to go together to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He could have baptized them one at a time, one at a time. So it is clear that when you accept Christ as your person, before you accept Christ as your personal Savior, the Holy Spirit has been wooing you, wooing that person, and the Holy Spirit is in your life. That's a different, that the Holy Spirit is in anyone's life, even long before. Some of those crazy people out there, the Holy Spirit is working on them and wooing them. We can't see that. And, and it, the Holy Spirit is guiding them and convicting them so that they know this is wrong, this is so on and so forth. But we're speaking of baptism, the baptism that demonstrates that a feeling that is different from the presence of the Holy Spirit in one's life. That's what I'm talking about. And yes, there are manifestations of it. When, when, when the church is filled with the Holy Spirit, the, look at what happened when Acts, when they were filled with the Holy Spirit. One of the first things they did, Peter and John went to the regular church, the, the synagogue, 
to share what they had experienced. And even though they were kicked out and mistreated and put in jail and beaten and whatever, they, they, they went and gave testimony of what they had experienced. The, another thing that happened was that they healed someone miraculously because they had this baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the third thing was that they spoke about Jesus without fear of death or persecution or any of those things. And, and, and those are some of the manifestations that are still available to the church today. But we're trying to do this individually. And, and, and yes, the Holy Spirit will be with us all the days of our lives. He's not going to abandon us but to be immersed in the Holy Spirit, the work and the manifestation comes, the immersion, the manifestation of that baptism comes in and with community. Yes. Right. We have a last question here. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Jesus says, I have power to lay down my life and I have power to take it back again. But you said that when he died, he knew nothing. So can you elaborate more on that to yes, know exactly yes, what you meant by yes. that? When, when Jesus was on the cross, um, go to John chapter 19. I think it's best if I answer this from scripture. John chapter John chapter 19, verse, beginning at verse 28. After this, where he talked about his mother and did a few things, this, his, his seventh last word on the cross, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill scripture, knowing that humanity had been saved and we know exactly when that happened, according to Matthew 20, Matthew 20. I'll come back to John, but let me just show you. According to Matthew um, 27, verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. So for three hours, when there was darkness upon the land, about the night um, Jesus was experiencing the second death so that we won't. That silent three hours was when we can point to his experiencing the second death. And about the ninth hour, when he came out of that second death, he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. So we know he's back to consciousness. John is picking up that story after this. After that moment in Matthew, knowing that all things had already been accomplished, that he had fulfilled the scripture and gone through the second death, and there was nothing in him for Satan to hook to keep him in the second death, so that he would never again be God, he came out and kn knowing that everything had been done to save humanity, he now turned to his own needs. And he said, I am thirsty. And a jar full of sour wine, which they offered him before he was, before he died, they offered him the, the before those three hours, they offered him the sour wine and he rejected it because he had not yet accomplished that which should be accomplished according to scripture. And you can, he, he did not want to be numbed or anything. He wanted to experience it as a real human being. Had he had any help with, from his divinity or from a, the, the wine, Satan would say, not fair. He didn't really go through this, so he had to do it raw so that we don't have to do it. And so after that, he, know, he said he's thirsty, and the same jar full of sour wine, which was standing there, they put on a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth, 
And when Jesus had received the sour wine, and paralambano, which means he received it unto himself, I like to describe it as he's sucking the sponge dry, he said, it is finished, tetelestai. For me, this is the best word in the entire scripture because it doesn't just mean it is finished, it also means paid in full. Our salvation was not just bought, it was paid for in full and beyond fullness. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit and died. And they took him down from the cross as a dead man and they put him in the tomb as a dead man and he laid in the tomb, you know the time sequence, and on Sunday morning he was resurrected, he awoke. He laid down his life willingly and he took it back up. You know, we like to preach and say the angel went in, I hear some great preaching, and the angel went in and said, um, son, your father is calling. No, Jesus woke up. <laughs> he, he, he laid down his life willingly, and, and when everything had been accomplished and he had his rest, his Sabbath rest, he woke up refreshed. 